So I'm at the Shalom Center in Bloomington, Indiana, college town. Trees, cute shops, parking meters to discourage the riffraff. I'm in line for a free breakfast, looking down the long queue toward the steam table. Damn, all the instant oatmeal's gone. I mumble out loud a lot. That shit settles my stomach. See, I just got off the ancient bus that the Genesis Project uh, works as a shuttle. They used to run a warming shelter for the homeless. We hang out there and sleep on cots in a large tent, 8 p.m. to 6 a.m., March to November. And yes, I just said homeless. The rest of the day, we're on the street. I usually hung out at the library, internet. But they kick you out if you're caught napping, meditating too. Wow, <sighs> that was embarrassing. But right now, the library's about a six block walk, breakfast, and a public shower away. The next guy in line looks like he just woke up in the early 70s. Army fatigues, a knit uh, dread cap over scraggly gray hair, thin guy. Must have heard me cuss out the oatmeal. Yeah, depends on donations. He doesn't look at me. Directly, I guess. Little bird glances uh, at my face, at my hands. The good stuff comes and goes. Yeah, sounds like, you know, life. Okay, I was a wannabe class clown, uh, but it did help me survive second grade, okay, guys? The white Rasta warrior stares right into my eyes, real fast, quick peer, then goes hazy a moment. Like he's lost inside. Then he cracks the goofiest grin I ever saw on the street. You're okay. He shuffles down the line. I shuffle right behind him. You too, guy. I like homeless folks. I never understood so social status anyways. Maybe because I am autistic. Most homeless don't pay attention to it either. Bob Dylan wrote about the street, when you ain't got nothing, you got nothing to lose. Homeless, no. Everyone's just a pink slip away from nothing to lose. Me and Ross to end up at the same round uh, lunch table, wobbling awkwardly back in the corner. We're wrapped in vinyl floors and cement walls. It's like a cold crypt. I'm Johnny. I reach out my hand. Been on the streets a couple of weeks. He disappears inside. He comes back with another smile. My name is Theo. I've been on the streets off and on. You know what? Let me try that again, because, man, he didn't talk that directly. My name is Theo. I've been on the streets off and on since uh, grad school. As I remembered, he'd set off to be a psych researcher cracked up before his, or before his orals. We had a lot in common. We swapped grade school war stories a while. This was one, way more fun than dodging crabby librarians. So we hung. We got into what a blast it is just to discover new shit. Any new shit. Academic shit, any shit. If it was cool, you know. You know, I never wanted to teach. He blurts out in the middle of my best story, okay? He's autistic, who knows? Then he looks away or run a department. Just research, use my brain. But the weird thing, a man, a few words and many pauses. I have jobs sometimes for a while, but I don't like the ones where I use my brain. I like the repetitive ones. I like factories, janitor. I can think. I'm in a different place. And there it was. Two homeless. Both crazy, more than likely. Both failures, demonstrably. Certainly neurodivergent. He knew it. I didn't yet. But here we were, strangers, talking joy openly, unashamedly, first time in our lives. 
in a homeless center. It was a strange moment for me, a, a shock of recognition, but it took four years more before I permitted myself to let it sink in. Four years on a diagnosis, by the way. I'm coming back to Theo and the Shalom Center in a bit, but first you need to hear this flash plaque, okay? Just like Pulp Fiction. If you wanna get autistic joy, if you want a genuine aha moment, and I want you to take a moment to think whether you wanna smother that autistic spark or fan those flames. So quick, I got no special effects. Here we go, screen title, Autistic Joy. What are you doing? My former mother's voice was sharp. I'm spread eagled in the backyard grass facing down. I've called you three times. She's annoyed. What are you doing? I don't know it in second grade, but I have difficulties shifting attention when I'm focused. So I try to replay the last few moments, listening to then interpreting anything she might have said while I'm in that focus bubble. I'm seven. Rewinding the tape is already automatic for me. A never ending attempt to comprehend what's going on. Anytime around people. Checking for verbal mistakes, mixed social cues, guessing if they meant what they said or were just mocking me again. Anyway, I'm still in the grass, sorting it out, choosing my words carefully to avoid trouble, clearing my throat, moving my sleeping tongue, loosening my jaw, just about ready to speak. Hey, what are you doing? Um, nothing. Close as I come to lying at that age. I've been in the backyard an hour or so, gloriously alone. See, Johnson City had this great hobby shop, all kinds of cool science toys. And I'd saved up my 50 cent allowance for weeks to buy what the red and yellow package promised, a real handheld glass, magnifying glass with all metal handle. I was squinting through it, entranced examining grass leaves, dew drops, and ants. Dozens of ants, one after another. Antennae, mandibles, eyes, guiltily burning off the occasional leg with focused sunlight. Endless fascination. No time, no place, no words. I was in the flow. Okay. Whatever you're doing, I wait for her command that will end my bliss. Stop doing it. It's time for lunch. I sigh, roll over, and trudge in. Hardly sounds like abuse, right? You know, the thing is, autistic joy is hard to explain, like to pretty much anybody who's non-autistic. Imagine that last delicious dream you're enjoying as you drowse in a warm, snuggly bed on a lazy Saturday morning when you don't have to get up. Then out of nowhere, someone screams, get up! You're so startled for a second. You don't know where you are, what you're doing, the time of day, the season. Now imagine that every damn day, many, many, many times a day. Torture, right? Being startled out of the flow, it's like that. Whether you're a kid or an adult, you dig? That's as close as I can come to explaining autistic joy. That same joy you see on the face of an autistic kid dancing endlessly, unashamed, in a sprinkler, in the sun. Lost to the world, found in himself. If I had to guess, this is precisely what, precisely what being in the moment, in the now, mean. I think that is where I spent most of my childhood. 
when I wasn't reacting to family, schoolmates, parents, teachers, the few humans I let into my life back then. Gradually as I aged, these blissful moments became fewer and fewer, further and further and further apart, nearly gone. First, I was forced into a school system that I was clearly not wired for. Rigid, lockstep, regimented, regulated, scheduled, boring, with no free time to be me, autistic me. Later, of course, it got much worse. Jobs, relationships, finances, life in modern adult America. Listen, I don't want to be a downer, but I had a stress-induced stroke at 30. Then, <laughs> nearly three decades in the therapeutic system. I worked with maybe a dozen pros. They couldn't sort out what was mental disability, what was trauma, what was bad attitude. Neither can I. All I know as it is, as a kid, I was either happy exploring or I was being forced to don my personality. To me, that means arbitrary vocabulary, facial expressions, body language, polite responses, and social lies that most humans demand. Just so it's easier for them to predict how I'll behave so they can be comfortable around me. Most humans project a personality I'm having a little trouble, guys. Give me a second. I'm going to take a drink. God, I wish that was vodka. Most humans project a personality automatically. But for me, it was like being dragged out of my comfy pajamas and forced into the most cumbersome, restrictive, awkward, embarrassing Winter coat, earmuffs, muffler, heavy snow boots, and mittens your mother ever stuffed you into to get on that kindergarten bus. So I got two choices, dancing in joy or shackled in chains. You choose. And I'm not the only autistic who felt that way about childhood or freaking school. From age two on, I clearly remember long waking periods without any verbal thought, just perceiving, in awe, in wonder, everything. Until I had to interact with humans, any humans, even those I was uh, required to love. But when that personality switched on, the joy collapsed, not into pain, collapsing into an all-absorbing effort, intellectualizing over every word, gesture, tone of voice of my own, and then interpreting, interpreting all those of each and every human I was with. And then carefully weighing precisely the right word, the tone of voice, facial expression, and body attitude to project all at the same time to avoid being in trouble. Plus, even at a young age, I had a growing sense of the need to protect others from me every single second. Because I was different, arrogant, hurt people without understanding. Because I was bad. So when this autist entered school, I brought two things. The capacity for bliss. And fear of shame. Over the years, the flow, the bliss got lost. The shame hung around like a fart in a closed classroom. I've written about how I work to regain autistic joy, much of it common sense, uh, rest, nutrition, reducing social contact and sensory stimulation, relaxation techniques. But the thing that's important to this story is how I've rewired my thinking on my special interests. A medical term that stinks of sickness. Some autists are trying different language, like specializations. They're not a forbidden pleasure, a shameful quirk, uh, something I waste time on when there's nothing more important to do. They're my guiding passions, my gateways to bliss, transcendence, oneness, 
my reason for being, my job. That spring day on the lawn in Johnson City, I saw infinity in a burnt off ant leg. And eventually I went for it. 